Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Cloud 3.0, Big Compute and the Digital Transformation. I'm Mika, the Product Marketing Manager here at Rescale. And presenting on this interesting topic today is Jonathan, our VP of Marketing. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. First, um, I'd like to let you know that we are recording this and we'll be distributing the recording later this week, as well as in our August newsletter at the end of the month. And secondly, if you have any questions during the webinar, please make sure to type them into the questions section into the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we will address these in a Q&A session. Okay, Jonathan, all yours. All right, thank you, Mika. Yeah, so welcome to this webinar presentation. First of all, I just want to give you a, a brief agenda of what we're going to be talking about um, today. So we'll start out with looking at the success of cloud computing over the last 10 to 15 years. We'll go on to look at what some consider the new big three in the 21st century. And then we'll look at why enterprises are moving to the cloud and a short history of the three major transitions in cloud computing. We'll go on to look at how hardware has evolved to meet demand and where this is going, so a little bit future looking. And then finally, we'll look at how Rescale fits into the very latest cloud picture. Finally, we'll round out with uh, some 3.0 uh, killer apps, which are currently creating some industry buzz. So this is a quote I found on cloud computing that I like. Let me just read it out. If someone asks me what cloud computing is, I try not to get bogged down with definitions. I tell them that simply put, cloud computing is a better way to run your business. So the question is, does this really hold up? Well, uh, the answer is yes. If you look at these uh, three-year growth indicators, um, of, of course, there's many reasons why these businesses have succeeded or, or not. But if you look at where cloud is playing into their actual business, um, you'll see that it has quite a large effect on their growth. And the highest, highest growth, in fact, is coming from those who have natively embraced cloud. In other words, they started out with the cloud offering. So, for example, companies like salesforce.com, um, and so on. But even the recent adopters um, over the last two or three years, for example, Microsoft and Google, who've come on, on a little bit later to cloud, they've also seen strong growth. However, those who've failed to execute on cloud more recently, including companies like HP, Oracle, Cisco, they're all a little bit below Dow and they're struggling to find uh, the business value. But this isn't a winner takes all kind of situation. There is a multi-cloud emerging, and we'll see the benefits of that a little bit later. So really, it's clear that the level of adop adoption in cloud uh, integral into integral business activities has improved uh, performance and shareholder value. So what are the new big three? Well, let's take a look at who the old big three were. Um, in the old industrial economy through the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, if you mentioned the big three to anyone, they typically think of General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. And, and they sort of powered the auto-centric society at the time. But of course, today we're in a new world, a digital economy powered by cloud computing. And some may argue that the new big three are Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud. So these uh, companies are likely as strong an influence in this century as their auto counterparts in the 20th century. But that's not the end of the story. The industrial segment is undergoing a digital transformation of its own. So they themselves are now becoming software companies. And this is quite an interesting transformation uh, as they adopt more and more software into their integral business activities. This is a quote from Mark Andreessen of uh, Netscape fame. He said, you're cruising along and then technology changes, you have to adapt. And another quote from him, in short, software is eating the world. So this kind of matches uh, what we're seeing in the, uh, the move from the industrial economy through to the digital economy. So why is cloud so compelling across so many different industries? Well, let's have a look at two different scenarios in terms of uh, compute infrastructure. First here on the left, um, typically a company will buy a large computing system. It's a capital expenditure, so they buy it up front. Um, and what you see is what you get. You, 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 know, you, you see your nicely installed, shiny new uh, compute system. 
But really, that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the cost outlay that you're putting in. There are many ongoing costs, and those typically come down to uh, long-term locked-in licensing in terms of software. It's a static resource. And of course, it's depreciating over time as well. But in fact, that's not all. I mean, there's many peripheral services that are needed to run this kind of system, including um, air conditioning, downtime, labor, maintenance, backup, the facility to house the, uh, the thing, and then disaster recover recovery and security. So there's a lot of ongoing costs in terms of an on-premise system. The alternative, of course, is a, a cloud-based system, and this is purely um, an operating expense. So there's no capital expenditure here. And the nice thing is that operating expense is well understood ahead of time. So, you know, you can optimize your expense allocation across people, software, and hardware. And that hardware and software can be purely on demand. There's no downtime for um, cloud computing. Typically, there are global data centers, um, so that's not an issue. And hardware is continually refreshed and optimized, so you're always getting the very latest hardware. So from that, um, you may have the impression that uh, cloud is everywhere and highly adopted in the enterprise. But in, in fact, that's not correct. Um, industry experts estimate we're only about 6% adoption in enterprise IT. So we're really at the very early stages of adoption here. However, despite this uh, low adoption, business leaders do see very high potential value. This is a, a VMware survey, survey of 400 business leaders. I just want to highlight a couple of things on here. So. If you look at, um, well, let me read out the, uh, the question that was asked. So the question was, what role do you think cloud computing could play in achieving each of the following outcomes for your company? And a couple of highlights were, uh, if you look at improve customer engagement, 57% you know, thought cloud could help with that. Accelerate execution, again, a high percentage you know, uh, agreeing with that one. And then scale costs to revenue, and another key one. And that one's really critical for startups all the way through to large enterprises. So the interesting thing about cloud at the moment is the current low adoption rates combined with this high perceived and real value. I mean, this is an industry primed for very high growth. And just an additional comment from the survey, around about 63% said cloud can make their organization more business agile and responsive. And companies with cloud deployments are three times more likely to achieve business agility versus their competition. So there's clearly a very strong pent-up demand and very positive attitudes towards cloud in the enterprise. And really that uh, report is echoed here by Larry Ellison from Oracle. He said during this new fiscal year, this was a couple of years ago, during this new fiscal year, we expect our software as a service and platform as a service businesses to accelerate into hypergrowth. So let's take a look at the recent history um, and foundational phases of cloud computing and cloud transformation. So the first foundation of cloud computing was really software as a service. We, we can call that cloud 1.0. And this uh, service transformed the delivery and business model. Everyday enterprise tools were suddenly on demand, synchronized across the whole company, and delivered relatively frictionlessly. So these uh, software as a service native companies shown here have really disrupted their um, core businesses and they've disrupted legacy enterprise software by innovating their business model to the cloud. So you've got a, a full range of business enterprise tools across the spectrum here. But it's not just native products that have thrived. Uh, legacy players, for example, um, Adobe and Intuit, have also had the opportunity to reinvent their business model. And they've pivoted to software as a service, and they've actually seen very strong growth from that kind of pivot. So these were originally um, legacy software providers and uh, have just recently removed, uh, moved to the cloud. So I want to pull out one of those that has a, is a particularly strong example of a legacy uh, software provider that's moved uh, to cloud. If you look at the Adobe um, business model, they originally sold a $2,500 annual license. Um, that was their model for many years. 
And more recently, they shifted that to a, five, a 50 to $100 a month subscription model. So their product team transformed the delivery model of their software to a browser-based solution with continuous updates. And in fact, customers were pretty much delighted with this change. You know, they really appreciated that. And I've seen this for myself with Adobe Tools. It's really striking if you look at the software, um, sorry, the stock price of Adobe um, from before that change to after that change. So Adobe's seen a huge acceleration in their stock price uh, since they made that change. And they've really created large uh, future value. And customers are willing to pay for that better value. So although um, the cloud infrastructure built out, was built out for software as a service companies, this uh, infrastructure as a service provided a layer of scalable storage and databases available from anywhere. And that uh, foundation layer, that broad infrastructure capability, has driven the next cloud transformation, which uh, is really big data. And we'll call it Cloud 2.0 uh, for the purposes of this presentation. Big data unlocks the value in very large data sets. Um, and it's interesting because as, as we move forward in this century, there's more and more data being created. If you look at how we're all connected, if you look at IoT, mobile, even social media, these are all causing an explosion in uh, the growth of data. In fact, I just read a statistic that 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. So the companies uh, shown up here on the right, these are all starting to unlock that potential and uh, extract information from these very large data sets. And in fact, one of the major innovations in uh, big data was connecting data silos and systems so that data is readily accessible uh, across, uh, across the internet. Just want to look at a real world example of big data from uh, Rolls Royce. Um, and this is all about um, the sales and after sales service of their aero engines. So they had a previous model where they made money during engine downtime. Uh, and the new model is now customers pay for uptime only and all the risks of aftercare are with Rolls Royce. So how does this work? Well, Rolls Royce can accurately predict engine failures using these advanced big data capabilities, which lead into predictive maintenance. So they can really tell when an engine is going to fail just by analysis of all the data from the engine. And the result of that is improved safety, customer service, and lower costs. And Rolls Royce are expecting customers to uh, uptake to rise from about 90%, sorry, uh, the uptake to rise to 90% from 70% over the next 10 years. And uh, this uh, slide shows the opportunities for big data across many different industries. Uh, this is derived from a recent McKinsey report. And uh, there's particularly strong value of big data in information, trade, finance, business insights, government, medicine, healthcare, and, and so on. And the leaders in all these industries uh, are extracting insights from the past, they're scaling, manipulating, and connecting enterprise data sets. It's interesting that this, uh, these two, Cloud 1.0, Cloud 2.0, software as a service, and big data, have already created over $100 billion of value in the enterprise. So where do we go from here? Well, big area of computing where companies have historically built out their own infrastructure is high performance computing or big compute. And this is for applications such as um, large scale simulations, physical simulations, and more recently, deep learning applications. What's interesting is that many think um, this high performance computing is readily available from, you know, you can order from Dell or even from your iPhone. But in fact, although computing capabilities have rapidly grown and become more accessible, the requirements have grown equally as fast, if not faster. So there's still a huge demand for high performance computing. And we're calling this, uh, this next stage of big compute cloud 3.0. So the world's uh, most challenging software problems in, in terms of you know, physical simulation and deep learning, it's pretty much still compute bound. And some of those categories are shown here. Um, areas like aerospace, oil and gas, automotive, life science, 
industrial semiconductor. Many broad verticals where simulation, high powered simulation is required. But these areas are still highly constrained by the computing that's currently available. And one of the problems is that due to the multi-million dollar investments and huge expertise that's required to implement you know, large computer systems, there's been a slow implementation of HPC in an organization, or the rate of change is slow to keep up with the requirements. High-performance computing is very, used very heavily in major Fortune 500 companies. Um, and just an example of some applications um, in aerospace, for example, you might be looking at computational fluid dynamics or electromagnetics. And th these types of problems can take days, you know, even weeks, and even on, on large high-performance clusters. Another area is automotive crash testing, another very computationally intensive problem. And uh, there are some areas that are only just becoming viable. If you look at life sciences, for example, molecular dynamics, epidemic modeling, drug discovery, these problems are so large that they're really only just becoming viable on high performance systems. So let's have a look at the um, hardware evolution over the last uh, 30, 40 years briefly and, and see where we're going. Uh, this is a slide from my colleague, Gabriel Bronner, who worked on the operating system of the descendants of this famous machine here, uh, shown here with Seymour Cray. And this could be regarded as the first supercomputer. Went out uh, at the beginning to government for research purposes. 1976, about 160 megaflop machine. And it was a special architecture, which was quite unique at that time. Okay, if you fast forward 20 years, the trend at this time was to move into these massively parallel uh, processing machines making use of a large number of standard processes. So standard processes to what you typically find in a, in a PC, but a lot of them. This machine uh, was about one teraflop performance. Interestingly enough, if you, um, if you compare that to an iPhone 7S, um, you're looking at about two iPhones. So if you cut this large stack in half, you've got the computing power of one iPhone. Quite, a, quite an impressive uh, acceleration in computing capabilities over the last uh, 20 years. In fact, uh, I, I used this machine when I was at uh, BAE Systems back in the 90s, and we used it for electromagnetic uh, simulation. So fast forward to very recent uh, times last year. In fact, that highly parallel architecture still holds today. It's still what's used in most um, high performance machines. This is a recent supercomputer installation from SGI operates about 5,000 times faster than the previous T3E. So the um, question is, you know, if you're an enterprise with many high performance computing problems to solve before your product launches, it would seem like this is the solution. Get one of these very large machines on premise, buy a similar machine to this. But in fact, that's not, uh, not the case because the reasons for cloud adoption still hold. This on premise machine is still aging and it still requires a large amount of operating expenditure. And of course, the reality is that many enterprises already have a large computer installation, but it's often not sufficient for the growing HPC requirement as we touched on earlier. So um, this is an interesting chart that just shows the uh, growth of supercomputing capabilities over the last 20 years or so. And just to, to describe what it shows here, um, num the number one, the um, the orange triangles show the fastest computers in the world at that year. And the blue square shows the 500th computer on the list during that year. The sum shows the total power or performance of the sum of all those machines in the top 500. And uh, just some interesting things to pull out here. If you look at the number one from 2008, that's today at number 500. So, you know, again, you see this very strong growth in performance over the last uh, 10, 20 years. Interesting thing is if you look towards the top of this graph, though, there is a, a, um, a slowing in the rate of increase. And, uh, you know, some argue that it's the end of Moore's law, but a factor is also just the sheer investment required to build the next leading machine. 
you, you, we'll come on to that in just a second. By the way, um, there is a cost estimate of around $400 million uh, investment required to beat the current number one machine. So whoever builds the next one, it's going to be a huge investment. I really just want to highlight the blue um, data on this graph. This is showing the uh, process of performance over the last 40 years. And what you can see in the blue is that the th single thread performance of a, a chip has grown very rapidly up until sort of the mid 2000s. And then there's been a bit of a plateauing effect. Um, so th this is a, is a problem for people who are you know, trying to build faster and faster supercomputers to match their workloads. The good news is that there are alternatives. So rather than just slotting in you know, updated chips into, into similar architectures, there are new architectures coming along uh, on stream that are optimized for certain workloads. So if you look at this um, uh, uh, picture here at the top, you'll see different processor architectures from different manufacturers. So obviously Intel is there, you've got Nvidia, you've got Microsoft, Google, and some of these are generating or creating highly specialized architectures which are designed for very specific software workloads. On the bottom, you've got um, different kinds of interconnect, some very high speed interconnect, interconnect. Some of these are proprietary. And these are also helping to drive um, speed uh, through these machines because the interconnect is a critical bottleneck uh, for high speed processing of data. So the faster you can connect the processes, the better. And uh, some of these technologies are extremely fast and uh, help drive uh, the speed of the whole system. So these specialized architectures are, are where we seem to be going at the moment for high performance computing and big compute. So now that we've seen a little bit about the history of high performance computing, let's take a look at a real world um, challenge from the past year. This uh, chart shows um, a tier one automotive supplier and it shows their kind of daily workloads and uh, it, it shows, you know, it's a very peaky kind of workload. And these workloads would typically be physics-based simulations uh, for the case of this particular supplier. And, you know, they clearly have high, um, high performance computing requirements. But the problem is um, they currently have a $4 million system on premise and it spends a lot of time not meeting the requirements. You can see that, uh, some days, you know, there's, there's requirements well above that blue line, which is the limit of the performance of that particular machine. And what that results in is a, is a lot of queuing and waiting. It could be up to a week, you know, sitting in a queue, waiting for its time to process. What they uh, may need, you know, to solve this problem is a $20 million system, because then you can see they reach their, every day, there's no queuing. They, they can reach the, the requirement every day. The problem is, as you can see, there's a lot of wasted cycles, a lot of days when it's uh, completely underutilized. So the solution to this particular problem was to shift workloads to the cloud. Um, what they decided to do is to invest 100K a month. And in fact, it yielded the same results. So the cost to them over the, th over the typical three or four year replacement cy cycle was in that same $4 million range. But in fact, they were being delivered the equivalent of a $20 million system. So by sending out uh, workloads to the cloud, they were able to reduce their, their costs significantly, but maintaining the performance of a $20 million system, so no queuing uh, and so on. So let's take a, look, a closer look at um, benefits of cloud computing for computationally intensive workloads. If we go through this list uh, briefly, you'll, you know, some of the things you can benefit from are faster time to market, um, shortened design cycles, transformed IT agility, you gain instant access to high performance computing, uh, integrated solutions. You know, we can, uh, in cloud, you can work with hybrid, you can work with private cloud, public cloud, bring your own computer system. So it's not a question of you know, replacing your on-premise system completely. That can be incorporated into a, a cloud solution. 
And of course, optimized um, cost structures as well, pay only for what you need with no additional capital expenditure. There is a problem with running on cloud though. Um, if you take a look at the uh, chart on the left here, this is an actual slide from a hardware vendor, which was part of a proposal. And it shows how to implement and tune a cloud computing stack for a particular enterprise. So the, the problem with it, you can see, is there are many individual tools and middleware to connect and optimize uh, to make this actually work. And it's not a trivial problem. Okay, uh, good news, of course, uh, and this is where Rescale comes into the picture, is that we, uh, we take all of that middleware, um, we have a lot of IP and, and patents that, that cover a lot of this, and we build that into a single intuitive interface um, with all of that work taken care of in the background. So on the right, you can see the Rescale interface, and uh, it's all of that um, complicated middleware and, uh, and so on is hidden in the background of our tool. And uh, to, to really make this work uh, across the globe, Rescale's partnered with the best hardware providers, uh, including Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, uh, Google Cloud, and uh, many others. And the other uh, interesting thing about uh, Rescale's offering is that you can have a geographic focus. So, uh, you know, if you're in a certain country where there are data restrictions sending data out of the country, you can choose a data center that's in that country uh, to meet your laws. And it also helps with latency, of course. In fact, uh, Rescale has five unique portals, two in the United States. One of them is ITAR, which I'll come on to in a second, one Europe, one Japan, and one in South Korea. So, of course, another vital part of making this all work is the actual software tools themselves, the simulation tools, the deep learning tools, and so on. And Rescale has over 200 commercial and open source tools pre-installed on the platform. Some of these are available on demand, and some of these you, you can bring your own license along. And just to pull out a, a couple of examples here, that, that you can see ANSYS, um, Dassault Systems, uh, Siemens, th these very large companies providing a lot of different simulation tools. Many of these are available on the Rescale platform on, to run on the hardware that, that I just showed. And you know, these are the typical kinds of applications, the physical simulation applications that these tools cover. Uh, so you're looking at things like finite element analysis, computational fluid dynamics, electromagnetics, and deep learning. These are all areas that require very intense uh, computational workloads. So another question that comes up a lot um, about cloud computing, and this came up from the very early days of software as a service, is security. You know, how do you ensure that uh, you know, the data transitioning to the cloud, processing and coming back to you, is secure. Well, Rescale has gone to a lot of effort to ensure end-to-end -end encryption and many other um, areas to, to improve security. And it's gone out of its way to um, achieve these different uh, certifications here, including one of the most difficult ones, which is ITAR. So Rescale uh, has very high confidence in security, and uh, this is something that we want to, want to highlight uh, in this presentation. So at this point, I want to take a couple of uh, a look at a couple of real-world examples. Um, the two founders of Rescale actually uh, were at Boeing, and they created the core high-performance computing and simulation stack used as part of the Boeing 787 wing design. They, this, uh, this process actually helped to reduce the wing weight uh, in a relatively short development cycle, and it enabled Boeing to achieve considerable savings over a relatively short period. So this, uh, it was a pretty disruptive approach at that time within Boeing, um, but it led to pretty drastic improvements. And this is what Rescale's platform enables for you know, many other industries as well. Another example, um, this is a launch vehicle um, company. It was launching um, rockets up to, uh, to launching satellites and so on. Um, and this company was using many simulations to optimize a particular product. Uh, with Rescale, they saw a 24 times speed up. And they were utilizing over a thousand CPU cores at any one time. So very intensive compute workload. Um, and interesting thing here is that the solution was deployed in under a week. So you know, if you compare that to an, getting a, an on-premise system upgraded, for example, which can take months, this is an extremely fast deployment and very quick turnaround. 
So I want to just move on to a couple of uh, sort of forward-looking and what we regard as killer apps for big compute or cloud 3.0. First of those, um, deep learning. And you, you may have heard the phrase, it's become you know, quite, a, quite a common phrase to hear uh, in the tech community. But really the value of deep learning comes from supervised learning or learning from labeled data via neural networks. And applications for it range from autonomous driving to tagging photos in Google Photos, for example. And the more data and the more computation that can be thrown at deep learning, typically the higher the performance and the closer we are getting to true artificial intelligence. What's very interesting about this application is that it turns out that um, processes previously used for graphics processing, GPUs, are extremely well suited for this particular workload. And this is due to the very high memory bandwidth and data throughput of GPUs. And you may have noticed uh, recently in the stock market, NVIDIA doing particularly well. And they're in a very fortunate position of selling pickaxes during a gold rush. So, you know, they've seen a tremendous growth uh, over a relatively short period of time as the uptake and the demand for deep learning and, and also machine learning has picked up uh, in a very large way. The very interesting thing about Rescale is it has the ability to spin up a turnkey full stack solution, including GPUs, without specialist knowledge of the implementation, parallelization, orchestration of all the algorithms behind uh, the specialty hardware. By the way, this shows the number of unique directories at Google associated with deep learning over time. Uh, deep learning has become so critical to Google that in fact they've introduced their own deep learning library called TensorFlow. And they've even developed their own custom processing unit, which kind of goes a step beyond GPU. They call it a TPU or tensor processing unit, and uh, which is a very highly specialized piece of hardware. This just shows some uh, typical deep learning applications. Um, areas like autonomous driving that I mentioned, robotics control, natural language translation, facial recognition, anomaly detection, drug discovery, and so on. There are more and more applications for this uh, being you know, discovered as, as we go along. So the second uh, kind of killer app I'd like to, to take a look, quick look at here, um, it's interesting that uh, if you look at a product manufacturer, they spend an awful lot of time on simulation, hiring skilled engineers, developing HPC clusters on premise to create new products. They put that product into service, and what happens at that point is the digital journey comes to an end. So in other words, they never collect feedback or, or simulation data while that product's actually in service. So the digital manufacturing and industry 4.0 initiative is an idea to kind of complete the digital cycle and tie IoT data, or which is sensor data on a product or digital twin information back to the whole PLM process in a kind of a continuous cycle. And the benefits of this are that you can then start looking at things like predictive maintenance, predictive analytics. You can actually predict when the product's going to fail in service, and you can work on extending that, or you can work on replacing it as required. And this actually goes back to the Rolls-Royce Rolls model that I mentioned earlier, who are using this kind of very program. Another example of a company doing this, in fact, a startup company called Boom Supersonic, they're using simulation data to set up their flight simulators, and then they're using those results to redefine uh, design in kind of a continuous loop. So these are massive digital data sets, um, are really ideal for cloud computing and, and scaling uh, on Rescale. So I want to round out the presentation here with uh, one final quote I like from the uh, Head of Advanced Technologies at BMW, Christoph Grota. He says it's going to be the Agile, the end up, that end up the winner. And uh, this is kind of what we believe at Rescale too. So Rescale delivers the agility that enterprises need uh, to be competitive in today's digital age. So to summarize this, uh, this presentation, Cloud 3.0 and digital transformation is underway. Uh, Forward-looking enterprises are already adopting cloud big compute, but there's still a long way to go. And all stakeholders in the enterprise need to understand the value of cloud 
so they can make informed decisions as they go forward and make investments. The and kind of investments we're looking at, at here are very high and they're very long term. So, you know, thinking about these things well in advance is, is a clear advantage in the enterprise. We, uh, we believe very strongly, of course, that cloud digital transformation and the algorithm, algorithms and simulation associated with those really will redefine the success of enterprises in the future. The good thing is we, we feel that Rescale is the leading man-machine interface that will help make this a reality. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to hand now, now uh, back to Mika. All right, thanks, Jonathan. That wraps up the presentation portion of our webinar. We're going to move on to Q&A in a second. So if you haven't already done so, now is the time to type your questions into the questions section on the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, while people are typing in their questions, I just want to point out that as a thank you for attending today's webinar, all attendees will receive a $20 Rescale credit that is valid for hardware usage on the Rescale platform. You will receive a promo code and a follow-up email from me within or later this week. Uh, in order to use that promo code, you'll need to sign up for an account at www.rescale.com slash sign up. And then my email will contain further instructions on how to apply the code. I also want to invite everyone back for our next webinar, Shifting On-Premise Deep Learning to Cloud on Rescale, which will be, will be held at the same time on September 21st. Okay, now on to Q&A. I'll kick things off with a question. Jonathan, um, as big compute is on the cloud is only a small fraction of the HPC market, what do you think is holding companies back from adopting cloud and what might need to change to allow for greater adoption? Yes, that's a um, good question. I mean, I, th I think um, there's a certain fear factor, you know, and, and concern about cloud. I think there always has been, you know, people that are, are certainly concerned about security. Um, uh, you know, they're typically running very sensitive data here. You know, simulation data is, is of course, you know, driving product development. So it, within the enterprise, it's very critical data to the competitiveness and, and the future development. So, you know, I, I think it's a question of reassuring and education about what current security offerings there are out there, you know, what, what Rescale has done to invest in that, that kind of security. Um, I think other things holding them back, maybe just, you know, maybe they just don't know about the capabilities. You know, if you ask a company what, um, what they should do if they need a large computation run, First thing they'll think of is, oh, I, I need to go to Cray, SGI, whoever it is, and buy a big compute system. You know, they maybe don't think about cloud as an option. So I think that's up to us in the cloud, you know, big compute community to really educate the market and you know, with this kind of presentation and, and other material, to get the message out there about what cloud is really capable of these days. Okay, thanks. And how does big compute depend on big data or are they completely independent? Um, I, th I think there is a dependency there. I mean, if you look at how infrastructure is developed, you know, starting with software as a service, that kind of, as I mentioned, that kind of built out the, um, the big data infrastructure. Um, and then following on from that, you know, you, you had the, uh, the big compute infrastructure based on that. But, but in fact, um, big compute is not just infrastructure as a service. You know, we're talking here about high performance computing. So, you know, the, the, older computers that were used for infrastructure were not necessarily set up or their architectures were not optimized for the kind of high performance workloads that we need today. So it's really quite a different um, set of um, computers and architectures required for cloud 3.0. Interestingly, I think the, you know, the providers, the hardware providers are you know, really understanding this and they're starting to, to change their compute offerings to optimize them for this sort of uh, high performance workload. Okay, great. Um, how do you relate this to digital twin or industry 4.0? So yeah, that, I mean, that goes back to the slide I showed. Um, industry 4.0 and, and you know, the digital manufacturing transformation, it, it's really poised to create huge amounts of data. You know, so if, if you look at what happened um, you know, with IoT, for example, or what's happening with IoT, 
IoT is really just a set of internet connected sensors on a, on a product or a device, but it's already generating vast amounts of data. You know, I kind of alluded to that when, with the amount of data being generated these days. So, you know, what's interesting is if you look at manufacturing through the whole process, there's a huge amount of data created, both, you know, the very early stage product stage of simulation through to the actual manufacturing stage with the IoT digital twin. Digital twin is where you, you have a sort of virtual copy of the, of the product that may, may even have virtual sensors built into it. And, and with that, you can really predict, you know, the, the real performance of, of the hardware. But all of these things are creating vast amounts of data and that data needs to be processed. It may be simulation data, uh, it could be um, machine learning data, and, uh, you know, I think that's where Rescale and Big Compute fits in in just processing that vast amount of data that is being created. And that's just going to accelerate in the future. All right. Uh, we've got a question about hardware. What hardware do you provide for CFD computations? Um, yeah, that's, that's getting outside my, uh, my knowledge a little bit. But as I understand it, you know, with CFD, you require um, particularly fast uh, CPUs, I think that's one of the, the major requirements, um, and highly parallel uh, workloads as well. So, you know, we, we do have hardware vendors that we work with who fit um, CFD extremely well, um, you know, able to spin up multi cores, thousands of cores at the same time. Um, so, yeah, in fact, um, CFD is one of the strongest applications currently on, on Rescale just to give you an idea of how well that uh, performs on the cloud. Um, all right, we've got lots of questions coming in. Um, currently, 6% cloud adoption is there. How fast can cloud react to a sudden shift towards its adoption? For example, what is the current idle capacity of cloud and how fast can it expand to meet new demands? Yeah, I mean, that's... Um, Interesting. I, I think you know, cloud um, hardware is kind of a it's a horizontal computing um, thing. So you know, it it can be expanded quite quickly. Um, so some of these cloud vendors actually have what they you know you have an instant market. It's sort of slightly somewhat market driven. So depending on the priority of your workload, you can have it run instantly, or, or you can put it into kind of a um, a different kind of queue where it runs, you know, maybe there's some short delay um, and maybe you pay a little less for that. But as I understand it, and again, this is slightly outside my expertise, but there is uh, a lot of demand, but there's also a lot of compute resources out there available on AWS, Azure. Um, they're building out their capabilities very rapidly. Um, I don't think they're going to run out of resources anytime soon. And, you know, as the demand ramps up, they'll continue to develop new data centers to, to meet the demand. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you comment on how customers will use uh, Big Compute with their installed PLM? Um, you know, again, that's, that's outside my area, so I, I have to defer that one, I think, for um, follow-up later. Is there any already available integration between big data with TensorFlow slash deep learning? Yes, um, TensorFlow is um, pre-installed on Rescale's platform, and uh, you know it has has been used for, for training and, and deep learning applications. So, uh, as I understand it, understand it, it, it works very effectively on cloud. Um, we do actually have a recorded webinar about this. If if you're interested in deep learning. Uh, from a month or two ago. And uh, as Mika mentioned, we have another one coming up. This is a very hot topic at the moment, so we do want to explore this uh, quite a bit further. Uh, what are the different risks associated with SaaS software as a surface? Well, um, <laughs> you know, Rescale is not really in that particular business. That's a business, business from you know, a few years ago. Uh, I think, as I mentioned in the presentation, you know, at the time, People were concerned about software as a service. If you look at um, um, Salesforce.com, for example, you know people were concerned that putting their their data, their customer data, on cloud was was you know not such a good idea. They wanted to keep it on premise uh, in a, a carefully controlled you know environment. But 
I think as people have become more um, understanding about uh, the way cloud works and the security aspects, again, they've become much more confident in in cloud. Um, you know, security, um, and also the other issue is, um, particularly with software as a service, is the uptime. You know, the, the data is always available, and the other interesting thing, and you know, I have direct experience of this, is you don't have to synchronize databases. You know, there was a time when people would have an individual database installed on their machine, and you'd have to synchronize, you know, so that you were always up to date with the server that was on your on premise somewhere, and everybody would have to do that. But when the data is in cloud, you, of course, you're always synchronized. So, you, you know, I think it's been a game of um, weighing up the benefits, and uh, in that particular case of, of software as a service, people have very clearly seen the benefits now. And if you go back to my very first slide, you, know, you, you see that in the, uh, the uh, stock prices of these companies who are running these services. Okay. Um, well, I think that's, uh, I think we hit all the questions. Um, if there are any further questions, um, please feel free to email them to us and we will follow up with you individually. Um, and I think that about wraps it up. Uh, again, thank you for attending. Um, just as a reminder, we'll be sending out the promo code and the recording um, today or tomorrow. And the recording will also be in the August newsletter at the end of the month. All right, bye and thank you for attending. See you next time.